Well, someone gave me the auspicious challenge, I think it was Milo, who said, well, Pastor, I don't know how you're going to follow that. <laughs> uh, neither do I. Maybe we should just, uh, you know, give the blessing and call it a day. But uh, I, I, I do want to introduce this morning what we're going to be doing uh, through the remainder of, uh, of this month. Uh, because it's, it's significant not just to us, but to the very theme that we ended our, our time of worship in, and that is being a blessing to others. You know, there's, uh, there, there are very few phrases that are as powerful to our hearts as the words, both giving and receiving these words, welcome home. Welcome home. I love one of the reviews that uh, one of the guests to River Hills left on, uh, on one of the social media, and it was this, when you walk into River Hills, it feels like you're walking into your family reunion where everyone is glad to see you. And uh, you know, I, I read that, and I'm like, I am so thankful for this congregation for that very reason. When you walk into River Hills, it feels like you're walking into your family reunion where everyone is glad to see you. Where everyone gathers, or better yet, where everyone regathers. As a family, there's a, a tendency to, to kind of revert to when you were last together in mass. Have, have you experienced that? Uh, in, in our family, it must have been back in the, the 70s. Scott always tells me that, that the 80s were the greatest decade. I'm not sure why he says that, but if you know Scott, you know that's what he thinks. I mean, come on, the 60s, the 70s, yeah, any, anybody? But anyway, back in the, back in the late 60s and in, in, into and through the 70s, uh, I, I am the youngest of four siblings, and, and the three boys had this, this, this deal where we would put the word big, the adjective big, in front of the one-syllable version of each of our names. So my, my oldest brother is David, and he became Big Dave. And my, my next oldest brother is Donald, and he became Big Don. And I, of course, became... Uh, no, not Little Dennis. At that time, I kind of was Big Den, let me tell you. But... Um, Big Den, it was, it, you know, and, and it, it, they, those names still come back. And my, my brother Donald, for some reason, likes to change the capitalization when, when, he, when he writes it out. And it, it looks kind of cool, you know. But we always know that we're home when someone, only those three, mind you, say that, right? There, there's something very powerful about that, and they're a part of that welcome home. And in these uh, weeks leading up to, to Christmas now, and including Christmas Eve, what I want to do is, is talk about the power of the names of Jesus. And uh, I, what I want to do is, is take us all into Matthew chapter 1 and, and chapter 2, and just to see what some of these, these names are and some of the nicknames for the reason for the season. There's an 80s nickname for you, for none other than who's the reason for the season? Yeah, you don't hear it so much anymore, but man, 80s and 90s, that, 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 was, that was the phrase, you know? And, but what I want to do is, is take a, a few moments because just as that song, The Blessing, is powerful, so each of these names, when, when you start to kind of unpack them a little bit, they, they, they become a powerful reminder of, of who God has blessed us with in the person of Jesus. And it's so easy for us just to take each other for granted, and it's so easy for us to take him for granted, isn't it? Particularly when we surround ourselves with all kinds of, of Christian artifacts. It's easy to think of Jesus as being on the shelf at the Hallmark store. 
And every once in a while, I think every day, but every once in a while, we, we need to just kind of clear that shelf and to take that one thing and say, here it is. And that's what we want to do. And I want to tell you right up front, Christmas Eve, the name that I'm going to focus on is the name of Jesus. Because that's what Joseph was told by God he was to name this child. And so we are going to talk about the importance of that name. So if you have a Bible or if you have a device, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. I'm not going to put everything up on the side screens. I'm going to put a few, of, uh, a few verses up there. I got not a whole lot of time, so we are going to try and blast through this real fast. Matthew chapter 1, it is weird. It is crazy weird. Because you start this story by saying this. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And you see that one, two, three, fourth word up there. And it's like, oh, here we go again. Right? Any of us who have tried to make our way through the Old Testament, you hit these, these lists of names. And it's like, what the heck am I reading this for? You know? And... Uh, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father, and it's like, oh man, right? But can I, can I point something out just right there in verse 1? This is the genealogy of, let's count how many names there are given to this person that, that Matthew is going to be looking at. Look how many names he shares with us right here in the very first verse. What's the first word? What's the first name? What's the next name? What's the next name? What's the fourth name? Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You, know, you might argue that, well, those are titles or those are, are, are descriptors, but they, they are names by which people referred to Jesus. And each of them has importance of its own. Now, now mind you, I'm not going to, to go through all 46, 47 technically names in this passage. And everyone said, <laughs> and so don't, don't, don't worry about that. But what, what I want to do is just kind of bring you to, to some highlights, okay? Because uh, the beginning uh, here, we just want to start With Abraham. You know, you have to realize that this person, Abraham, the son of Abraham, is where the whole Jewish story began, right? It's in Genesis chapter 12. You might want to read that this week. But what happens, Genesis chapter 1 through 11, is this ancient history of, of everything. Ancient history of, of creation, ancient history of, of, of how, how people were, were people. You have the story of, of, of the first sin. You have the story of the first murder. You have this, this story of, of uh, particularly this one in chapter 11 called the Tower of... And if you've hung around me long enough, you have to realize that the problem with the Tower of Babel wasn't that they were trying to build a stairway to heaven. The problem, if you read that story, is that they say this, let us make our name great. We have some fine architects. We know some guys at Kramer Construction. We can make our name great by building the biggest skyscraper the world has ever seen. Let us make our name great. And God doesn't have a problem with skyscrapers. But he wants to set people straight. And so, check this out. He calls this guy, Abraham. And he says, Abraham, I want you. 
I want you to leave everything that you think would make you great. I want to, you to leave your nation. I want you to leave your, your extended family. I want you to leave your business. And I want you to go there. Uh, where, where, God? There. But where? Wherever I take you. And then God says to him this. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. The whole story starts there. But I just read it totally flat. But here's how I think it should be read. And I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. And I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. You see? And Scripture says that with regard to these promises that God made, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. You see, for the first time now, we, we, we have this, 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 this deal that it's not about so much what you do as it is about what your disposition is toward God. Abraham did what? He, he believed. Now, understand, it starts with that. It starts with, with that, that belief and that trust, but belief and trust is, is demonstrated by putting one foot in front of the other, right? And so Abraham did exactly that. And Matthew, in this chapter, is saying, this guy Jesus... He goes all the way back to Abraham. And you all need to know that. Now, here's the thing. Matthew was writing to a Jewish crowd. Just about everybody who read the, the Gospel of, of Matthew was, was already Jewish, and so they, they would say, well, whoop de doo so do we. <laughs> We're all Jewish too, so yeah, Abraham's our father. And so, do you remember those words? He also, Matthew does, also says, well, yeah, but not all of you can say that you are a royal heir. You see, Jesus also, down the line, came from King David. This is King David we're talking about. And you have to understand that, that there are all these promises that, that, that were made to, to King David. Now, the Jewish audience would have said, yeah, you know what? We kind of have a bone to pick here. Because this, this deal about King David, these promises to, to King David, well, they don't seem to be exactly coming true. That his throne would be established forever and that his kingdom would have no end. See, here they were now. They were a people who had been, been blasted apart and they, they were attempting to regather, but at the same time, Rome came in and conquered them and now it would be as if we had Russia occupying the United States. Now, how would we like that? How's it going in Ukraine? As they're trying to do that. And we need to remember to keep praying. for the, It's so easy to let the news cycle just kind of... You know. But here, here are these people, and they're, they're saying, wait, we, we have an occupying force, and yet these promises which were made to David, and... Matthew's like, yeah, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. And so if you read this, this section, it says, and I am going to cheat now. I am going to say, and, and 
Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, and Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Abimadab, Abimadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Solomon. It looks like Salmon, but it's Solomon. And the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, and so on. And we have to pause and say, well, wait, 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 wait. Matthew is doing something really weird here that no other genealogy does. Now, again, ladies, you know that um, what, what, what I have taught for years is that the New Testament and even the Bible really shatters the patriarchy that existed in their culture. But the shattering takes time. You know, you can't do it all at once. And so, so here is one of those shatterings. Because right here, Matthew does something that, that, that other genealogists don't do, and that is he names women. He names four women. And some, some Jews would be scandalized by that, but moreover, they would be scandalized because Zerah, Boaz, uh, uh, rather Rahab, I'm sorry, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, were probably all non-Jewish. Now, not only that, but oh man, we don't have enough time, darn it. It would be so fun to go into this. Tamar, twice widowed, and whose father-in-law was required to, to provide one of his sons to be his wife, but instead, uh, I'll, I'll read what one commentator says. The story takes a rather odd turn. After Judah's wife had passed, Tamar disguised herself as a harlot and offered herself to Judah, unbeknownst to him, for he did not recognize her. Three months later, when Judah learned that Tamar was pregnant, he insisted Tamar be punished. That's when Tamar brought forth Judah's staff, seal, and cord. Do you remember reading this story? And Tamar shows up and says, Well, father-in-law, you're the dude. You're the dad. And here are the items you left in my tent to prove it. And everyone's like, oh. You know, Rahab, the prostitute who helped capture Jericho. Ruth, a member of the Moab tribe, arch enemy of the Jews. And notice how polite Matthew is with regard to David. Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Uriah was, you know, may he rest in peace, is what Matthew should have said there, um, because David had an affair with his wife and conceived Solomon eventually and had Uriah put to death. What's Matthew doing? What is Matthew doing? This, this is scandalous. And you know what he's doing? You see, when, when, when people came to say, oh yeah, well, Jesus was a great Jew. Oh man, he's in the line of David. Maybe some of the promises that, that, that an heir would, would take over David's throne and reign forever, maybe those do apply to, oh, wait a second. Wait a second. Didn't we hear that, that Mary had this crazy story that, that the baby inside her was conceived by the Holy Spirit? Didn't, didn't she say that? Matthew is saying, you know what? I don't care what you say about Mary and Joseph. But you have to understand that God takes every single circumstance. 
He can use any circumstance. And look, even King David had ancestors who were pretty broken and messed up. God's thing is to take broken and messed up people and take them out of broken and messed up situations and use them for good to bless other broken and messed up people. I don't know about you, I don't relate to perfect people. I relate to broken and messed up people. Some of my favorite people in the world are people who are going through recovery because they admit that they're broken and messed up. And they know it. And that's what Matthew was doing in this genealogy. Isn't that cool? I love, I love this. I had, I had this, really weird, um, this really weird friend when we were living in South Bend. We were part of a, an intergenerational uh, Bible study group. And uh, one of the oldest couples in the group, the second oldest couple in the group, um, he, he was sharing when, when he, the moment that he said yes to following Jesus, he, he sat down and he figured he better figure out who this Jesus was. And uh, so he decided the place to start is at the beginning of Matthew. And so he reads the first chapter of Matthew and a miraculous thing happened. God like burned it into his brain. And he could memory, it was like he had, for one fleeting moment, he had photographic memory, and for the rest of his life, he was able to, to recite Matthew chapter 1. He read it once, and he could recite it from memory after that. And, and we, we were talking about it, and he said, why do you think I was supposed to memorize a genealogy of all things? It was like the most boring thing in the world, and we started talking about this. And it's like, dude, the powerful stories that are embedded in in uh, Matthew chapter 1 are so cool. So cool. And so this whole genealogy unfolds and, and it's, it's kind of funny because Matt, Matthew says, and so, therefore, there were three, three sets of 14 generations each from Abraham to David from David to the exile, and now here, 14 generations each. Now, he takes a little liberty with that number 14, but you have to understand that when they looked at stuff like this, they didn't look at it the same way we did. When they made a family tree, they would often leave out insignificant people. They, they, they would leave me out and, you know, jump to, to one of my kids who will probably be rich and famous, you know? But skip me, because I'm kind of, you know, the black sheep or whatever. And, and do that. But notice they didn't do that here. Matthew didn't do that here. But he then says, 14, 14, 14. And what's the big deal about 14? Well, here's the thing. Jews love what's called numerology. And the word David, the name David, every Hebrew letter can, tr translates, crosses over into a number, pairs to a number. And when you add up the letters of David, they add up to the number 14. And so at the end, he's like, case made. This guy is someone that you need to pay attention to. You need to pay attention to, and you need to realize that no matter what, no exceptions, we are heirs to a promise and to a call to be a blessing to every person we meet. And it's so interesting because that's where this genealogy goes. And then you get to the very end of the book of Matthew. And, and Jesus says these very words. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then this next word, therefore, and do you know what words follow? Therefore, he says, Go, help me, go, go and make disciples. And I've always thought that the therefore had to do with all authority has been given to me. And so Jesus is like standing there and saying, all authority has been given to me, now do this. But I, I think what he's saying is, all authority has been given to me. My, my, my father has given me this. Now, based on everything from the first verse to here, in this book, therefore, go and be a blessing. Go and, go and, 
And just as, as Tamar and, and Ruth were, were, were of questionable background, like me and like you, forget it. Just go and be a blessing. If, if you've been blessed by God, go and spill it over to somebody else. Band, can you come back up here? How many of you would like to leave this place hearing those same words? Just a short version of that song we ended on. That would be so cool. Can you come and do that for us? But as, as they're coming up, all these names prove that Jesus was in fact a good Jewish boy and man. And proving that Jesus came in fulfillment to predictions, to prophecies, thousands of years in the making. And proving that human purity, be it racial or social or moral or whatever, is not what brings one into relationship with God. Moral purity does not bring you into relationship with God. Social purity or racial purity does not bring you into relationship with God. The color of your skin does not bring you into relationship with God. But it is the invitation of God and how we respond that brings us into a relationship with God. It is the invitation of God, of Jesus, to come and follow me that brings us into that relationship. And so Jesus would close with the words, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Go and be a blessing to everybody that you come in contact with. That's on us. Let's go and be the church doing just that. It starts with your and my, our invites. Christmas Eve, the single most likely day of the year that someone will accept an invitation and visit church. For the rest of this month, now, you better get here early because we're going to feature cuts from the music that we've done on social media, and we're going to invite people to church. Because wasn't this beautiful today? Yeah. And don't, don't you believe that, that people need to hear the hope and the joy and the peace of God and of Jesus during this Christmas season? Don't you think they need to be introduced to the 80s reason for the season? Um, don't you? And remember that, that blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And then God says, and so they, that is we, will put my name on people. We, Hillsters, will put God's name on people and he will bless them. And now may his favor be upon us. Thousand generations 
and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going and your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you he is for you we go and that's why we go to be the church to let them know that God is for them and invite them into that beautiful relationship amen let's go and be the church